keyboard to put somewhere. All right, today we're gonna be discussing doing the work. Look at all this work I have to do today. A lot happened over the weekend. It turns out when a lot happens over the weekend, you got a lot to do. This morning I replaced the lights in the foyer because they were flickering. And I uh, reset the Google Home because it stopped working. I don't know how I feel about the Google Home or any other device like that. You think they're listening to us? Fortunately, we don't do anything illegal, so it doesn't really matter a whole lot around here. But um, you think they're listening to us? Could be fun. They didn't get to listen to us for the last week or so. I knew because every day my wife would ask what the weather is, and uh, it would never tell us. So anyway, that's all done. One thing done. Zoop. All right. Today, before we talk about doing the work, I want to talk about minimum defense frequency really quick. Someone asked, in multi-way pots, what happens to minimum defense frequency? Long story short, minimum defense frequency, whenever you're look, trying to find the minimum defense frequency for multi-way pots, you take the nth root of whatever the normal minimum defense frequency is, and that will give you the minimum defense frequency per person. I realize that's kind of complicated. Actually, it's kind of irrelevant. What I typically like to do, for simplicity, Take whatever the minimum defense frequency is, divide it by the number of people facing a bet. So there's two people, say minimum defense frequency is normally 70%, call it 35%, recognizing that sometimes a specific player will have to defend more than the other player. Um, and very often that's the case, right? Like usually the player on the button should defend more than the player in the cutoff, just because the button's in position, right? So the button should be defending more than the cutoff. However, understand that minimum defense frequency though very often does not apply in many scenarios like on the flop. On the flop, you should very often be drastically under defending compared to minimum defense frequency if you are out of position or if the board is not good for your range. Look at this shark back here. Taking a face dive. Here, you want some money? No, that's too heavy for you. Here, you want some money? No, that's too heavy for you. I'm gonna start calling you all sharks. How'd you like that? Would you all like to be called sharks? I'm gonna start calling you all sharks. Maybe I should make a new logo. Maybe it should be a shark. What do you think? Can we make a cute little shark logo? It's all the stuff back here. Make a cute little shark logo. We could put a hat on it whenever I'm uh, trying to um, conceal my tails or I could wear sunglasses when I'm concealing my tails or I could have a professor outfit on if we're, if we're talking, presenting. We can't use baby sharks. I'm sure that breaks um, some sort of copyright issues. The J card sharks, exactly. Maybe we should be the sharks. Hello, sharks. If you wanna be a shark, mash the like button. If you don't like sharks for some reason, let me know. We're not gonna be mean, malicious sharks. We're gonna be nice, friendly sharks. They just smile with their giant teeth and eat your, eat the fish. All right. So that's how minimum defense frequency works multi-way. Take the nth root of the normal defense frequency amount and being the number of people who are in the pot. But in reality, um, just divide the number, uh, the minimum defense frequency number by the amount of people you have to act. That said, recognize that um, minimum defense frequency does not actually apply in most scenarios. Okay? We should be orcas because they eat sharks. Jason, that's a little bit too educated for most people. I don't think most people know sharks eat, or orcas eat sharks. You like sharks? It seems I swim with them often. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be in the, at the table with the sharks. Yeah, I like the shark from Nemo with the smile. No, see, like, even that shark's too mean looking. Like, that shark's supposed to be scary. I don't think you want to be a scary shark, because if you're a scary shark, no one wants to hang out with you. You want to be a nice, friendly shark that people want to hang out with. So, yeah, make sure... Let, let me know about that. I don't know. We're, we're considering... We'll make a mascot. We'll make a, a shark mascot. And you all will be the sharks. All right. Today, right after this, 9, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time for Poker Coaching Premium members, we have office hours happening right after this. Eight people. They're already selected for this time. They'll be able to call in live and ask me their questions. So if you like this show, if you want to do substantially more strategy in a show like this, check it out. Poker Coaching dot com slash Halloween. We have a sale right now. You can get in for as little as two dollars per day. If you want to study poker and you go to poker, poker coaching is the way to go. All right. Um, today we're going to talk about doing the work. What do I mean by doing the work? Well, 
Essentially, don't be lazy and do what needs to be done. And do it happily. Do it willingly. Do it, you know, really. I mean, happily is the right word. Do it joyfully. Be happy with the work that you have signed up for. A lot of people do not fully recognize that quite often they are in the situation they are in because of the actions they have taken previously in life. Not always. I understand some people are just dealt really bad hands. Some people are dealt really good hands, right? Most of us, though, I think are dealt kind of um, normal hands, right? Like I, I was a kid. Um, good, you know, good parents. They they did their absolute best. Um, had to get a scholarship to go to college, right? Which was fine. I had no problem with that. Didn't graduate college. I realize most people don't graduate college. At least a lot of people don't. And um, I was working like a, a minimum wage job. So like that's that's not particularly a great start. Now it's a great start to compare to someone in. Um, a country that's not doing great, who has various um, disabilities, for lack of a better word. Uh, so, I mean, we're lucky like, like that. We're lucky, uh, lucky I was born in America, where you can, was a bit of more of a meritocracy than a place where, like, if you are born not rich, you're just not going to be rich, right? But understand that you are in your situation because of the work that you have done, good or bad. Fine. Personal responsibility, how dare you? I know some, some people don't like this, and if you don't like it, whatever, you, you're welcome to cancel me. Um, okay, so understand that just because you are where you are does not mean that you cannot change where you are. And very often you need to sit down, you need to assess your scenario, ask, where am I? What am I trying to get? Etc. And then set forward a plan to get the things that you want in life. And you can get the things that you want in life. You have to work hard, plan ahead, study. And um, really apply yourself. When did the office hours start? 10 a.m. Eastern time in 50 minutes. Let's see. You have 750 bucks. What should you do now? You should keep playing your $5 tournaments. That's what I would do if I were you. How can you log in and listen to the next show? If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, go to PokerCoaching.com. In the top right-hand corner, there should be a link to go get into GoToWebinar to listen. If you're not a Poker Coaching Premium member, you can sign up right now, pokercoaching.com slash Halloween to get a discount. If you want to pay full price, go to Poker Coach. Actually, I think it'll give you a discount no matter where you go to. You can't pay full price. I just have to give it. I'm giving everyone a discount right now. Being born in America is like winning the lottery. Indeed. Vote for Trump and keep it that way. <laughs> Some, someone posted something the other day. It was funny. It's like Americans voted for... The, the person who pays the least amount of taxes around the country. It was funny. It was a funny joke. There's been a lot of jokes about politics recently. Um, anyway, let's not talk about politics now. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about poker. How do you do the work in poker? How does that entail itself? Or how does that, uh, how does that um, come about? Sorry if I'm using poor words, trying to read... Uh, hundreds of replies at, at the same time. Um, how does it apply to poker? Well, first things first, you need to study. You need to study. You must do study to succeed at anything in life. Um, for example, politics. If you want to discuss politics intelligently, you must do an immense amount of study. Not just of the news, especially not of Facebook. You need to go to the source and learn things. So many people think they have insight into things that they are actually just clueless about or speculating about or listening to other people. Beautiful example of this, beautiful example of this, is the uh, Daniel Negreanu Doug Polk match. If you go to the uh, various internet gossip forums, um, everyone thinks that they know exactly what's going on, yet half of them don't even know the rules, they don't know the stipulations, they don't know the particular side bets. And they act like everyone else is an idiot because they don't think exactly like they think about something they have actual no information about. Which is funny. It's funny to someone who actually knows to some extent what is going on. Right? I, I think it's important to understand that in a lot of um, games, a lot of betting markets, the person with the better information tends to win. Now, certainly there's going to be an immense amount of variance, like the Dale Negreanu bet. I think he's going to lose the match, but I think five to one is a really good line on someone who's probably going to win, I don't know, 20, 30, 40% of the time, right? And a lot of people cannot wrap their head around the idea that they may not have all the information. 
beautiful example of this. Someone was saying, oh, Negreanu has no side bets. Well, like, I personally know that he does, right? He mentioned it, like, a day after. I knew that he did, right? And some people were saying he's going to quit after 12,500 hands. And since Bill Perkins gives him, gives him amazing odds on a bet, he's not quitting now, right? So it's like people think they're making bets with knowledge of, it, of something that may occur without having full information. And when you make decisions and plays without full information or without as much information as you can possibly get a hold of, you're going to make bad plays. So how does that apply to things like poker? Well, in poker, some people you're going to play with, the Sharks, have full information. They're very close to full information, right? Whereas a lot of the uh, recreational players, the fish, for lack of better words, for lack of better words is going to be the term today. It's a little bit, a little bit dicey in today's environment, huh? Um, the the batter the, the fish essentially have not studied. They've not done work. Therefore, it's like they are betting on a game with substantially less information than others, right? Imagine, I mean, whatever. I was going to talk about insider trading, but you all know what insider trading is. Like, imagine I know my company's about to go bankrupt, and I own, I don't know, 20% of the stock, and it's a publicly traded company. I would sell the stock, right? But that would be illegal because it's insider trading. Now, the interesting thing is, is that in betting markets like sports betting or poker betting, you are rewarded for having better information slash call it inside information, right? If I know how to, you know, check raise the turn better than you do, that's part of the game. That's what I'm supposed to be doing, right? I'm rewarded for knowing that better than my opponents. And in things like betting on Negreanu versus Polk match, I am sure some people have very clear information on what Negreanu is doing to study and get good at poker, whereas other people do not. And um, if you have good information and you know he's either doing a lot of preparation or almost no preparation, maybe he's getting loosey-goosey eating a sandwich. If he's getting loosey-goosey and eating a sandwich, then probably shouldn't be betting on him. You should be betting against him, right? But if he's um, in great shape because he's beating the best players in the world, then, you know, you're in great shape, right? So it's important to understand that if you don't have that information, you're just guessing, you're speculating. And therefore, if you're guessing and speculating, your opinion should not actually matter all that much. So many people think that their opinion, their thoughts about something matters immensely, whereas in reality, their opinion is formed not by actual information they have learned, but by what they think, what they speculate. And this is why a lot of people lose at poker. They have not done the first thing you need to do to, to succeed at poker, which is to study poker immensely. You must study poker immensely. And if you don't study poker immensely, you're going to lose. So that's part one of do the work. You got to do the study. If you don't do the study, you don't do the research, you're guessing. Now, you can sometimes sidestep research with data, but most people don't know how to make good use of data either. Like, um... Negreanu Polk match, right? There's not really a whole lot of data on things like this in particular, where you have a challenge with someone who doesn't really play heads up against someone who does play heads up. Um, and you don't know the motivation of the player who doesn't play heads up, right? So, like, data doesn't necessarily apply here. I know you can run all sorts of um, simulations, like I did in my video on YouTube, right? Um, that, that generally makes it look like it's going to be a reasonable bet on Negreanu. But it's kind of hard to actually get historical data. And that's a historical data may not even apply to this place, because imagine... You had, uh, let's say, 300 heads-up matches like this, where you have someone who's not a heads-up player against a very good heads-up player. How often do they win, right? If we actually had a two or 300 matches, that could be very relevant. That said, maybe Negron is better than the average player in those matches. Maybe he's worse than the average players. You don't know, right? And that's where it's um, difficult. So you got to study. you got to get information. You have to get data, etc. Okay? Next. You got to put in volume. If you're a poker player, you must put in volume. You have to actually sit down and you have to actually play poker, right? You must actually put in the volume. If you don't actually play, don't expect to actually win. Imagine you studied a lot and you were the best theoretical player in the world, but you never actually showed up to play. This would be like... Um, Federer, the tennis player, it'd be like him practicing a ton, getting in great shape, and then never going to actually play a tennis tournament. He just, like, practiced a lot. He was really good. 
What good does that do him? Well, not a lot besides stroke his ego and make him good at tennis in theory, right? You need to actually get in there and you actually need to put in volume. And poker's a great game to put in volume because the results you get over the long term are very, very indicative of your skill level. I get emails from people every once in a while saying um, something effective. You know, I study a lot and I, I play, but I'm still losing. What's going on? Well, the answer is very often they're studying the wrong thing. Someone asked earlier as a joke, does watching, um, I don't know, some, some goofy video blogs count as studying? The answer is like, obviously not, right? But a lot of people out there, especially the uh, non-sharks, think that that is what studying is. They think having a beer and watching a Twitch stream where someone's one tabling a $20 tournament is study. It's not study. You're wasting your time. Well, to be fair, you're not wasting your time. You're entertaining yourself, but you're not actually studying, right? Studying implies sitting down, studying specific scenarios like we do at PokerCoaching.com. If you watch the videos, I've been watching some a lot of great videos by Matt Affleck recently where he goes through very specific scenarios. Like someone raises, you defend big blind, you check the flop, they bet. What do you do with various stack sizes? Studying those specific spots will help you learn that specific spot well. If you're just watching someone play, Someone tried to call me on Instagram. If you're just watching someone play, then you're going to see like a mix of random scenarios, right? There, there might as well be just like a hodgepodge of nonsense. And you're not going to get the same spot over and over and over and over and over again. And when you don't get the same spot over and over and over and over again, you're not going to be able to figure out how to play that scenario and the ins and outs of that scenario. You're just like, you're a casual observer. And there's nothing wrong with being a casual observer, but understand that's not how you get good at something. It's like um, when people are in a class and they're playing on their phone, they're playing Candy Crush. They're crushing all the candies, but they're not really learning anything. They maybe learn a little bit, but is your goal to learn a little bit? No, your goal is to get great and crush the games. I'm not trying to teach all of you to be tiny winners. Something a lot of training sites out there I think actively try to do is try to make you tiny winners. I'm not trying to make you tiny winners. I'm trying to make you big winners. And fortunately, we've been successful with lots of the students. Um, let's see, does practicing, putting in the volume, could that be part of studying? Um, playing is not the same as studying, in my opinion. Playing is vo the volume part of the equation. Study is the away from the table studying part of the equation. You need to study away from the table before you play. And in my opinion, not everyone agrees, but in my opinion, you should be spending the vast majority of your time studying until you're a winning player. Once you become a strong winning player, that's when you can kind of stop studying at a very, very high ratio. When I say a high ratio, I mean like you should be spending 60, 70, 80% of your time studying when you are not a winning player yet. Before I ever played a hand of poker online for real money, I'd already bought like every major poker book on the, on the market. This is before training sites existed. And I was already like pretty good, at least technically at poker. And I lost no money when I started playing. I started with 50 bucks and um, ran it up like the kids do. Now, to be fair, I kept very good bankroll management. I always kept 300 bets for limit hold'em, which, you know, was a lot as a kid. Um, probably still not a lot, and then enough. You probably really need like 500 bets for limit hold'em. But anyway, I kept a big bankroll, just grinded it up pretty fast. And why did that happen? It's because I did the study ahead of time. It's kind of like if you wanted to become a brain surgeon. Do you think the right way to go about becoming a brain surgeon is to just cut up somebody's head and hop right in there? No, you'd be put in prison. Instead, you have to go to school for a long time. A long time before you get to cut up somebody's head. Now, once you become theoretically sound at cutting up someone's head, then you can do whatever somebody wants you to pay you to do it to some extent. But you have to get good before you should be playing for substantial money, assuming you care about money. Assuming you care about money. Now, look. The great thing about poker is it's not like brain surgery because when you're playing poker, if you want to lose your money, that's fine. It's fine. You're allowed to lose your money. You're not allowed to cut up somebody's head without their consent, at least, or even with their consent if you're not a doctor. But if you don't care about your money, this doesn't apply, right? And I understand a lot of people don't care about their money. They want to gamble. There's nothing wrong with playing poker like a gambling game that it is, right? It's okay to gamble as much as you would like, and poker is a great game to gamble at. So, recognize this video is for the sharks who are trying to win money, not for the people who are splashing around trying to gamble. If you want to gamble, do whatever you want. Nothing wrong with doing whatever you want. I have no problem with people who want to spend their time and effort gambling, but that's not how you get good at something, right? So, okay, first, you need to study. 
need to put in volume. Next, you must have discipline. Discipline, in my mind, does require work, effort, etc. So, what discipline is required in poker? Well, first things first, you have to actually do what you know you need to do at the table. So many people really generally know how to play pretty well. Especially, I have students at PokerCoaching.com who, if they analyze their scenarios away from the table, they're usually pretty spot on. But when they get to the table, sometimes they make errors. And that's because there's a disconnect between actually knowing how to play well and playing well for some people. Usually this occurs whenever you lack experience. If you just haven't put in enough volume to the point that you're a little bit, um, you just like your, your brain gets distracted while you're playing. Or perhaps they're not practicing proper bankroll management, which we'll get to in a second. Or um, they're not actually playing to try to win money. They're at the casino to goof off. And again, nothing wrong with going to the casino to goof off, but you know, if you're spending a lot of time away from this, the table trying to study and get good at poker, then you would presume you're trying to win money at poker. Now, what can you do to fix this problem? It's a tough thing. I'm a pretty big fan of the idea of biological conditioning. I used to have um, horrible anxiety when I had to go play a trumpet solo in front of the school at halftime shows at football, at the, at the football games. Um, I was a good trumpet player, not the best trumpet player ever, but I was a pretty good trumpet player and I had to do solos. For some reason, the band director gave me solos that were too difficult to play. Don't know why. Maybe thought it was fun. <laughs> I thought, it, I, I did not think it was fun, but I think it was actually a really good life lesson for me that you are going to fail sometimes and everyone's going to see you fail and hear you fail. At the end of the day, nobody cares if anybody can play a trumpet, so it didn't matter, but it mattered to me, right? That's the interesting thing about life too, is that everything that you are doing, you think matters a lot. But most people don't care. <laughs> um, but anyway, that taught me that I'm going to fail sometime, fail, and failing is okay. Now, I always showed up and I did my best. I prepared to the best of my ability and just not within my uh, skill set, right? It'd be like putting someone who is a $1, $2 winner into a twenty-five, fifty game and saying, have at it. You're going to do your absolute best, but, you know, hate to break it to you. You're probably going to lose more often than not. Um... So what did that teach me? Well, it taught me all you can do is prepare, try your best, and sometimes it's still not going to be enough to fully succeed. And that's okay. That is okay. Continue practicing, continue studying, continue getting better. And you also have to ask, is this what I want to be doing with my time? But anyway, you must have discipline to do the right things. Good example of this, to play the trumpet solos, I purposely, let's call it, I purposely sat out for some of other parts of various songs to give myself better stamina during the trumpet solo. Because it turns out if you're playing trumpet for a long period of time, your mouth gets tired and that's when you start failing, right? It's like when you sprint. If you sprint, imagine a solo being like a sprint, the rest of everything else is like a jog. Turns out when you're jogging and you got 20 other trumpet players who can carry it for you, you, you don't really, you can kind of sit out in those instances. So, a minute before that trumpet solo, you can be very confident Jonathan Lill is sitting out. He's not playing hard before that, he's taking it easy if it makes logical sense, right? And then you have a much better chance of doing well. This is um, equivalent to not grinding all the time and being burnt out, especially right before a, a big game. Like for example, whenever I'm gonna go play a major poker tournament series, I will basically never play the day before the main event if it's not a substantial tournament itself. Like imagine there's a $10,000 buying tournament and then the day before it there's, I don't know, a good, vol good value $1,000 satellite. Very often, I'll just skip it because the value on the satellites, let's say 500 bucks, let's say I have to play for eight hours to win 500 bucks. First things first, that's not all that great of a win rate to begin with. I don't know, call it 70 bucks an hour, 100 bucks an hour, whatever, call it whatever it is. Do I want to sit there for eight hours for $100 an hour? And the answer is probably not, given I could relax, chill, study, not experience variance, not do anything to like subconsciously mess up my mindset. And understand, like, I think I have really good mindset compared to most players. Yet I still am trying to protect it to the best of my ability, right? Like when I was playing trumpet, I had better stamina than every other trumpet player in, in, the, uh, in the school, but wasn't quite good enough. So I recognized it, right? Does this show count as studying? This is part of studying, but this is not fully in-depth studying. I would definitely recommend you study the material at pokercoaching.com. Again, check out pokercoaching.com slash Halloween. You want to come in and say hi? Come in. 
Here's my wife, Amy. Do you think watching her talk about life in poker, is this count as studying? Do you think this counts as studying? Yes, yes, Amy thinks this counts as studying. This is why she is not a shark. We're gonna try, we're gonna start calling everybody sharks. I wanna be a shark. Okay, good. I'd love to be a shark. Hi, little sharks. <laughs> we can't say baby sharks because that, that's no, copyright. Not being, can't little say sharks, baby sharks. Little sharks. Yes. Sharks in training. Sharkawans. Sharkawans? <laughs> no, that, that's almost certainly copyrighted. Too. I'm sure Star Wars has everything on the lockdown unless you're playing on ACR and they steal Yoda. But um, they have a Yoda avatar. Not allowed. Mm. Not allowed. Hi, Sharkawans. Hi, Sharkawans. How are you? <laughs> um, so, yeah, what are you doing? I'm getting ready. Bye bye. You got to go work? Holla, don't follow. Nobody knows what that means, John. Okay. Um, little sharks. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Um, you think we can still make as much money today as you could 20 years ago? No. In any competitive game, the game's going to get tougher over time. That's how all competitive games work. Beautiful example of this is running. You wouldn't think people would be able to run a whole lot faster today than they could 100 years ago, but it turns out they run a lot faster today than they did 100 years ago because they have better information. They can study better. They have better discipline. All games that have any amount of money attached to them or any amount of incentive attached to them, it doesn't have to be money, right? There's plenty of games people play for effectively no money. Um, all games get tough over time. That's part of it. All right. Next. Um, let's see. So that's poker. Look. To, to the do, idea of doing the work at poker is study. You have to study. You have to put in volume and you must have discipline. One more thing about discipline. You have to keep a proper bankroll. You must keep a proper bankroll, right? If you don't have the discipline to play within your means, you're running the risk of going broke. For running, people have better materials. Yeah, like shoes, tracks, better coaches, better data. Sounds a lot like poker, right? With poker, you have higher higher uh, caliber computers, you have coaches, you have training sites, you have solvers, you have loads of data. You have, you have a lot, you have better information is what it amounts to, right? You have lots and lots of better information. What high level study plan do you suggest? Easy thing to do to get started. Go to pokercoaching.com slash Halloween, sign up for premium membership. If you're a cash game player, go through the cash game challenge and the cash game masterclass. If you're a tournament player, go through the 30 day Tournament Preparation Challenge. That's going to get you ready to go right off the bat. I also have a giant tournament course launching at the end of November that will be everything you need. When you're doing a session, do you, after you're finished, you go through and compare with your range charts to see if you made mistakes. I'm not looking for like pre-flop mistakes because I'm always referencing charts or have the charts memorized ahead of time. If you're playing games, especially simple games like cash games where you're playing 100 big blinds at all times or roughly 100 big blinds, print out the charts, put them behind your computer, you know? That may be against terms and conditions on your site. Don't be a cheater on your site. But you sure better not be making basic mistakes like using wrong preflop ranges. If you're using wrong preflop ranges, you're screwing up. Go to pokercoaching.com, go to the tool section, click on downloadable charts. We have charts for the main games that you will find. We have uh, six max with rake, four max with rake. We have hundred big blind soft live cash games. We have, um, I think it's 75, 40, 25, and 15 big blind tournaments with ante. So anyway, all those charts are there available for you. Check it out, pokercoaching.com. Is there an alternative to poker coaching premium because you have no money? Listen, even if you're playing micro stakes, you need to spend some time and effort getting good at poker. Sounds like that's what you want to do. Go to pokercoaching.com, sign up for a free membership. There you can try out the site, see everything we have to offer. Also, go to my YouTube. We have loads of content on YouTube. Some of it actually came from Poker Coaching Premium. So go to YouTube, search whatever you want, and you'll find it. Let's talk about self-improvement. So we talked about poker, how to do the work in poker. Now let's talk about improving yourself. It's important to improve yourself because you are one of the main assets in your life that you have under your control, right? Don't worry about others. Don't worry about various games. Work is on getting yourself better. First things first, get rid of nonsense. A lot of people have nonsense in their life. And I would actually recommend every month or so, you have a little check-in with yourself 
where you ask yourself, do I have nonsense in my life? Let me tell you some nonsense I pruned out recently. Some of you are going to find this stupid. Mario Kart on my phone. Turns out I was spending about 20 minutes a day playing Mario Kart, usually in one minute burst when I was waiting in line, etc., etc. But what good does playing Mario Kart on my phone do me? Literally nothing. Literally nothing. Sure, maybe it's fun, maybe it's entertaining, but do I really need that? Shouldn't I be playing some, um, what shouldn't I be like going through the poker coaching charts and studying and testing myself, looking at various scenarios like that instead in my one minute of free time? Like, obviously, right? Why do I care about playing Mario Kart when I could be getting better at my actual main skills, right? So that's some nonsense in my life that I have to cut out. And I'm pretty sure that most of you have a lot of nonsense in your life. Calibrates hand-eye coordination. I already got great hand-eye coordination, Michael Clifford. There was a, one time I went to, actually it was right before the pandemic, we were in New Orleans for a bachelor party and they had this bar slash arcade. And there was this basketball game where you like push down on the basketball, you push down on it and it like shoots the miniature basketball with a puff of air up into the hoop, okay? I started playing this game and we started betting on it. And I was beating everybody by about 50 to 80 points every single time, which is a lot of points. Basically, I didn't miss. I have really good hand-eye coordination. I played first base when I was a baseball player. I did not, if I could touch the ball, I didn't miss the ball. And um, I'm already, already got that pretty much on lockdown. We can juggle. One thing I'm trying to do is like juggle like this, like overhanded, you know, like it has to fly from here over to way over here. That's actually substantially harder than right here, right? Right here is it's easy. But um, anyway, like I'm pretty good hand-eye combination, hand-eye coordination type stuff. So I don't really need practice on that. And I'm good at Mario Kart. I win at Mario Kart, right? They have a little challenge. I'm always at the top of the challenge because I'm good at that kind of thing. Um, anyway, you need to get rid of nonsense. And clearly Mario Kart's nonsense. Maybe juggling's nonsense. Maybe uh, like doing handstands. Maybe handstands are nonsense. Um, but anything in your life that really isn't helping you, doesn't have to be hurting you. But maybe it's just not helping you. You should probably look to prune it out. Especially if you're not getting all of your work done anyway, or your mind is a little bit um, taxed already anyway. Like, I do a lot of stuff. I'm pretty busy. And I feel like most of the stuff I do in my life is relatively high value. Hello. We're talking about pruning out nonsense. Do you think that you filing away these receipts is useful or is it nonsense? I throw them out after the end of the year. So it's nonsense then? Not during the year. <laughs> After the year, it becomes nonsense. Oh, I see. Okay. Bye, I love you. Amy takes care of me. That's what it amounts to. She's very nice. But anyway, you got to get rid of the nonsense in your life, whatever that is. If you have a good wife, she's not nonsense. Let's talk about bad relationships. Now that Amy's out of the room. Um, if you have bad relationships in your life, I hate to break it to you. It's probably not good. It's probably not building you up. If your relationship is not making you better and making your partner better, it's probably not optimal for you. A lot of people are in relationships that are, it's gonna sound bad, they're just like, they're just there. It's kind of like a roommate, right? And I, I understand that's maybe what some people want out of relationships, but you can probably do better. And a lot of people feel very, um, let's call it pot committed when it comes to relationships. They essentially meet someone, get in a serious relationship. They prefer to not, um, they prefer to not break up with them and find somebody else because that's a big pain. Maybe they think they can't do any better. But if you're in a bad relationship, you should probably at least discuss with your partner how do they feel. Um, you should ask, maybe they feel the same. Maybe they feel like you or they're kind of pot committed. Hate to break it to you, if you're both pot committed, maybe you're not actually pot committed. Now, it gets way more difficult once you have moved in together, once you got married, once you've had a dog, once you've had children, right? And I understand some people are in tough spots, but to some extent, as long as you and your partner are reasonable, you can probably make splitting up work within reason. Um, you can have bad friends, right? A lot of people have bad friends. A lot, some people have friends who they've had been friends with for forever. They love to go out drinking. They love to go out drinking Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you want to go out with them a lot of the time, or at least sometimes. 
hate to break it to you, you probably don't want to be going out Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to go drinking because it's not good for you. It's not beneficial for your work, right? And I'm not going to say to totally cut these people out, especially if you have a great time with them, but moderation is important on things that are fun, but perhaps detrimental, right? Let's see. So you're all typing in a bunch of things. Why does it never answer your questions here? Well, Adam Smith, this is a recording. I recorded this a while back, so I don't answer your questions because I don't see them whenever whenever you post them. This is a recording. Have you heard of the five-second method? It's a method where you method to motivate you for things. No, I, I don't have a problem with procrastination. Do you play Warzone? I don't play much of anything. I play Hearthstone slash Magic the Gathering minimally. Minimally. You need to cut out doom scrolling on Twitter. Yeah. Scrolling on Twitter is nonsense. Scrolling on Facebook is nonsense, right? Which of my two books is better for pure, pure cash games? Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games, Volume 1 and 2. <laughs> How about that? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Charts are printed on the wall. Good job, good work. Oh, all of you like my comedy. If you like my comedy, click like, click subscribe. Should you ask the villain in the 4-bet pot on the turn? What are you asking, Michael? Michael, I don't know what you're saying. Hope you're having a great day. He has around 10 questions per second. <laughs> How about you join the poker coaching study session on Discord? Yeah, we do a um, study sessions on Discord. Make sure you check that out. Louis Fleet's in charge of it. He does great work. You're live, but not live. That was a joke, Michael. That was a joke. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Lots of gullible folks in the chat. Lots of gullible folks in the world. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Self-improvement. What else? Get rid of useless hobbies. Get out of bad relationships. And generally, make yourself stronger, smarter, more sane, right? Try to get in decent physical shape. I'm not going to say you have to be in super great shape, but you should probably be decent to the point that you can get around, right? Um, maybe you should start, start studying other things or finding some hobby that makes you more educated at the same time. Like playing Mario Kart doesn't really help you. But maybe, um, learning a foreign language does, right? Maybe that's helpful and beneficial to you, right? Let's see. Is going out and drinking worth the risk of a hangover and worse play versus a fun night out? Eh, says the drunken fool. I mean, again. Every, everything's risk reward. Are the office hours the same as the inner circle? Similar. We're doing office hours today for poker coaching premium members. Eight people have already signed up. They are going to be, I'm going to be answering their calls for about 15 minutes each. That starts in 20 minutes. Pokercoaching.com should be in the top right hand corner if you're a premium member. If you want to sign up, go to pokercoaching.com slash Halloween. You need to use sarcasm hands. I'm not sure what a sarcasm hand is. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Next, um, you can do the work to better others. Add more payment methods like Skrill. If you want to pay me using Skrill, NetTeller, Bitcoin, PokerStars, GG, Ethereum, Bitcoins, Decreds, <laughs> Litecoins, Silver bars, beanie babies, whatever you want. I don't really want pogs. I don't want to be paid by pogs. But anything else you want to pay me with would probably be okay. So if you want to pay me using various payment methods, send me an email, support at pokercoaching.com. The problem is you don't want to have a list of like all of your payment methods on your site because then it becomes very unwieldy, right? You don't want people to like read through the list and think, oh my God, I have a big pog collection. I need to try to unload this to Jonathan Little because I don't want that to happen, right? I don't really need any more pogs. So... If you want to pay me using a different method, send me an email, support at pokercoaching.com. We'll hook you up. Does NetTeller still exist? Yes. Oh, Murray, sorry. You had your pog collection ready. Brutal. He takes Decred. You're my man. My biggest crypto holding is in Decred. There you go. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, bettering others. Let's talk about bettering others. You can do the work in poker, self-improvement, bettering yourself. Let's talk about bettering others. There's a lot of value in helping others improve their skills because inevitably they will want to help you too. 
If I said, for example, I would like all of you to um, pay me in pogs going forward, you know what you all would do? Some of you would start paying me in pogs going forward. But I don't need pogs. I told you the other things I would, I would accept. Um, underst understand that sharing your knowledge is going to help others have a better life. And most things in life, most, most aspects of life are not zero-sum games. They're positive-sum games where you help others and they profit and you profit. And whenever people cooperate and work together, it turns out they do substantially better. Now, I understand poker is a abnormal space because it is a zero-sum game or negative-sum game due to the rake. And at the end of the day, we are all trying to beat each other at the table. However, I am not playing with you all all that often, right? And you all are not playing with each other all that often. I have a lot of followers and students, but there's a whole lot more poker players. I don't know what percentage of poker players I have on my email list, but it's got to be like some fraction of 1%, right? And understand that you can make communities, even in negative sum games, that can work to better themselves to progress, right? I mean, I got good at poker because people were willing to help me back in the day. And we were even playing sit and goes back in the day, where it was just like me, Phil Galfon, Dave Benefield, Andrew Robel, and a few others grinding it out, battling hard against each other and four or five bad players. We were all making tons of money, hand over fist. And we were all working together to improve our skills, right? And that was like, I don't know, the most cannibalistic environment. And we still all prospered. And you can prosper too in many, many other aspects of life, including poker. So, I mean, make study groups Learn with friends. Sign up to PokerCoaching.com. Get a discount. PokerCoaching.com slash Halloween right now. Sale ends today. Better make use of it. Um, join the study group. Louis Philippe runs a great study group for Poker Coaching members. Go to the poker and go to PokerCoaching.com. Click the community tab. Go to Discord and go into the study group thread. So there you go. Teaching others is one of the best way to learn unconscious competence. It's very important to understand that most of the money and improvements you're going to make at something is not because you're learning the various small corner cases. It's because you know the fundamentals better than everybody else. Someone asked earlier, do you go back and like try to find spots where you messed up according to the preflop chart? It's like, no, if you're messing up according to the preflop chart, you're not taking it seriously to begin with. And if you're not taking it seriously, seriously to begin with, hate to break it to you, you're probably not going to succeed. Aren't we just trying to find ways to break even? No, we're trying to find ways to crush the game. We discussed this earlier, Steve. I'm not trying to teach people to break even or win a tiny amount like a lot of other training sites are doing. We're trying to teach people to crush the games. How often should you experiment and try new things? That's an interesting question. I don't actually do a ton of experimenting. I let other people do the experimenting for me. Fortunately, I have loads and loads of data that comes from um, studying and learning from a lot of other players who, who have the data and are happy to share it with me. And... That allows me to tell you all what works and what doesn't work. I, I mean, I have multiple videos on PokerCoaching.com of current exploitative plays that are working well today. And, I mean, that's just there for the, for the students, right? Because I understand that you all want real-time exploits based on loads and loads of stats. Very, very solid one, for example. Say, under the gun raises, someone calls, someone calls, someone calls, we're in the big blind with um, queen-jack offsuit. The logical play here is to call. Turns out calling is way better than folding, Right? But in the small and medium stakes games, three betting is often way better than calling. You actually profit a decent amount by three betting, assuming the under the gun player is not tight when you're playing like 40, 50 big blinds deep. But almost no one does it. And you would probably not find that play without either experimenting a lot or getting loads of data. The problem with you experimenting is you're not going to put in very much, um, very much volume here, right? But if I have a thousand students and I tell a hundred of them to do it and maybe they lose a little bit of money, maybe they made some money, who knows, but they come back and they report to me that, hey, we made more money this way. Now we have more of the students do it. Then we have everybody doing it. Next thing you know, we know definitively that this play is better than the other play. It's not the GTO play, but it's an exploit that works, right? So the problem with experimenting is that the information you get back in return is usually not all that relevant because you have a tiny sample, but Data is very, very useful. All right, I have to go. When you do the work, make sure you enjoy life. Make sure you enjoy life, okay? If you're doing work you don't particularly love, 
probably find new work because at the end of the day, we don't have a whole lot of time on this earth. And if you're not enjoying yourself, if you're not bettering others, bettering yourself, having a great time, you're probably not doing the right thing for you. So, you know, study your past, study the things that you've loved doing, study the things that you want to be doing and get in there and do it in your free time. Get in there, learn, study and do it. All right. Enjoy yourself. Make the most of your opportunity because time's always running out. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Again, I'm going to be going live for the next two hours answering questions at pokercoaching.com slash premium. We have a office hour show where people are going to be able to call in and um, ask me questions live in real time. So check it out, pokercoaching.com, top right-hand corner of your dashboard if you're a premium member. Click on that link. Get right in there. I'll see you all there very soon. If you like this show, click like, click subscribe. Have a great week. It's Monday. Make the most of this week. It's going to be an exciting one. I can already tell.